Shweta Jairam and uh, Rakha from Ajivika Bureau, and Carol Ubadhyay and Harpreet Kaur from NIAS, and Alicia Vyas from uh, Manipal University, and myself. So shall we start? And we'll be following the same order. So that means uh, your presentation first. So we have roughly 15 minutes, and Aditi is here to tell us when to stop. <laughs> So another interesting, yeah, just one more point. So these papers, it's quite interesting that all these papers are basically discussing about uh, informal workers. And uh, out of four, interestingly, three papers are on migrant workers. That was different forms of migration. And uh, except this Ajivika Bureau's paper, the other three papers are basically looking at Bangalore's labor market. So in that way, it's quite an interesting combination of papers. Yeah, please go. Let's start then. We're going to be talking about uh, circular migrant workers in Ahmedabad and the manner in which they negotiate claims to a basic standard of living in the city. Uh, this is part of a, a larger research project that was undertaken by the uh, Ahmedabad Center uh, of Ajivika Bureau and we're just here in a representative kind of capacity. Just to set a little bit of context, um, Ahmedabad is recognized as one of the fastest growing cities, not just uh, in India, but internationally as well. It's kind of um, cited as the success story of neoliberal reforms and the poster child of the Gujarat model of development, which we all know is sort of based in a very uneven regional development, uh, which means rural immiseration uh, that is engineered on, the, on one end, as well as um, large-scale investment in uh, large urban agglomerations where all employment is generated. Uh, and this is sort of uh, based on a system of rural urban migration and very repressed labor wages, even though uh, people are engaged in very high growth sectors. Uh, this kind of economic policy has not just remained economic, but has uh, sort of uh, spilled over into uh, a reorientation of social spaces and relationships and affected democratic and governance institutions in the sense that moving from a bureaucratic welfare state model uh, to a very market-oriented uh, techno-managerial sort of uh, setup uh, based on the state's legacy kind of with complicity uh, with elite interests. Uh, this growth, uh, like I just said, is subsidized by the system of circular migration, which is engineered by the dual processes of, on the one hand, primitive accumulation in rural areas and urban-led uh, capitalist accumulation in, um, uh, in Ahmedabad city and other major cities in Gujarat. Uh, this stream of circular migrants kind of enters into very ghettoized sections of the labor market where all kinds of labor laws are suspended, where uh, minimum wages or even living wages are not paid, uh, safety, uh, safety regulations or social security is sort of totally um, uh, uh, they kind of fall through the cracks of these regulations uh, and um, these are groups that are disproportionately comprised of historically marginalized uh, sections such as uh, SC, ST, OB OBC and Muslim communities largely around 50 percent who are Adivasi is drawn from uh, southern Rajasthan, northern Gujarat and um, western MP. Uh, <coughs> How we define circular migrants is anyone who spends 3 to 11 months in the city, but they never settle, they always return to their villages because they are not able to create a foothold in the city. Uh, mobile workers, in this sense, also become marginalized citizens because not only are, are they in the lowest ends of the labor market, but they also end up in highly informal, criminalized, and unrecognized spaces in the city. Uh, there's been a lot of conceptualization of neoliberal cities as sites of contestation, especially in terms of urban poor populations uh, who uh, are in informal livelihoods, moving away from shop flow mobilization against the employer because of the informal nature of their employment relations and the inability to establish employee-employer uh, relations because they're in non-standard forms of work to uh, making claims on the state through neighborhood-based mobilization, electoral mobilization, and vote bank politics. But this kind of contestation actually doesn't accommodate circular migrants because uh, not only are they in very informal kinds of labor where they can't make claims on the employer, but they are also unable to make claims on the state as uh, voting populations because they do not have any forms of official uh, proof of residence in the cities that they work in. 
so we started out our research with the basic question if uh, migrants are not able to make claims on either the state or the employer how do they exercise their claims how do they access a basic standard of living in the city and how can we understand the logic of their survival in the city uh, and more formally our research questions uh, sort of try to answer uh, to what extent are circular migrants able to access public provisioning and how do they negotiate this access on a daily basis? Uh, and I think before going forward, it's important to know that uh, in our conceptualization of the research, we took the word city and the term circular migrant to have inherent meaning in the context of access to uh, public provisioning in the city. And we later demonstrate how these categories itself break down through our evidence. Uh, so methodology, uh, we did 285 interviews uh, to understand, measure, and describe uh, the nature of access that circular migrants have to housing, water, food, sanitation, and healthcare. Uh, 24 focus group discussions with about 100 uh, participants as well. And this was, the sampling was sort of based on 15 years worth of experience that Ajivika Bureau has in Ahmedabad, uh, informal experiences of our field teams. Uh, that's how we kind of uh, tried to organize these focus group discussions and surveys. Um, we had a lot of cross-sections as well. Occupationally, we looked at the five uh, largest growth sectors in Ahmedabad. So construction, factory, hotel, uh, head-loading, and domestic workers. Uh, Housing-wise, we had four categories. Open space settlements. So these are typically uh, under flyovers, under bridges, on public land, railway land, with very informally constructed settlements out of discarded items. Uh, Worksite housing involves workers living on construction sites, on factory floors, uh, near extremely hazardous machines, uh, you know, head loaders living inside head loading markets and hotel workers living inside hotels, dhabas or restaurants. Um, and finally, rented rooms, which can be 8 by 8 to 20 by 20 semi-pakka or pakka rooms, uh, largely in charlies or informal kind of rented markets uh, in Ahmedabad. Um, and there's a fourth category that we won't cover in this presentation. <coughs> uh, and importantly, uh, you know, through this sampling and through the process of interviews, um, we were aiming to establish citywide trends um, by aggregating data, you know, so what, is it, uh, what does access look like for people living in open settlements or what does access look like for people living uh, in rented rooms. But we, quick, we quickly realized that in the attempt to aggregate, uh, we were actually falling into the same traps that the state does. We were falling into the governmentality of the state, which neatly kind of classifies uh, messy realities in order to control. And so what we're going to be presenting today is actually the diversity and heterogeneity among the categories of circular migrants, which is why I said that, you know, we began by saying that circular migrant has an inherent meaning, uh, but we later quickly realized that it doesn't because of the heterogeneity, and that's what we tried to embrace. Uh, and for lack of time, I'm just going to explain that through three quick examples. <coughs> so the first one is open space settlements in Vasana Garden and Arjun Ashram. Um, these are Adivasi families seeking daily construction uh, work from labor nakas. Um, and the logic of their, uh, of their survival, the logic by which they live in these spaces, is, is manifold. Uh, number one, uh, they choose to live close to the naka. Um, they have developed social networks in these areas, particularly with petty labor contractors. Um, so it's easy for them to get work. And even despite these networks, they are only able to get work for 15 to 20 days in a month. Uh, secondly, um, these communities are ones that have agricultural ties to their villages, um, which means that they desire the flexibility and mobility to continually move between the city and their villages. Um, you know, and so by living in the open, they save on rent, on average 7,000 rupees per family per month, so that they can use those savings to invest in that agriculture in the village. Um, these communities are also uh, those that have uh, social and cultural ties to the village. Um, and by investing in those social and cultural ties, they are able to maintain social standings in the village in a way that they're not able to do in the city, which is why it's, you know, they, they kind of choose or they're compelled to choose to live in the open to save on that rent, uh, 7,000 rupees per month. <coughs> um, and finally, they choose to live with their communities because in a hostile city that is historically marginalized and a hostile state, quite frankly, that is historically marginalized uh, Adivasi communities, living with their community is the only way to navigate the city. Um, but uh, for these choices, uh, they must play a trade-off game, right? So for living in the open, they forfeit guaranteed access to water, sanitation, and oftentimes food. Water is sought from uh, neighboring housing societies or from railway quarters by negotiating with security guards at the gate on a daily basis, which means that the access is dynamic, informal, and not guaranteed. So there are days or weeks uh, during which families might not have guaranteed access to water. 
sanitation uh, to access sanitation women must wake up at three in the morning um, to access you know sanitation structures that are often five to six kilometers away oftentimes spending two hours just to access sanitation um, and you know these families are constantly at the risk of eviction um, especially on railway land um, um, yeah so the, the game is one of sort of trade-offs right uh, choosing to live in the open to save on rent and live with their community results in uh, complete forfeiture of access to uh, guaranteed water uh, and sanitation. Um, yeah. <coughs> the second case is on-site housing. These are also Adivasi families, but of a very different nature. Um, these families come from Baswara district in southern Rajasthan, uh, which has faced extreme desertification and rural dispossession, which means that they don't have agricultural ties to their village. All of their income comes from migration. And so their logic of survival in the city is very different from the logic of the Adivasi families that I described earlier. Um, so they need guaranteed work. They are not able to have that flexibility and mobility between the village and the city, uh, which means that they are compelled to accept uh, more hazardous and dangerous conditions of work and living. So these are families that actually clean ash from large boilers in, in garment factories for 16 hours a day. Um, in some ways, that ensures relatively more guaranteed access to food, water, and sanitation. Um, but the quality is extremely poor. So water is available um, for two hours in the morning and one hour in the evening uh, through pipes that are actually used for industrial production. Uh, there is no provision for, for clean drinking water, uh, but the access is at least there. Um, and sanitation as well, even though poor quality, uh, you know, one might argue that, that the structure exists on site. Uh, but in exchange for this very abysmal quality of access to water and sanitation, although relatively guaranteed, uh, families must give us the freedom and the mobility that I talked about, right? They, they work 16 hours a day. Um, they are bound to a single contractor who can decide on whim uh, whether to increase, decrease their wages or even give them access to water and sanitation. Um, and they cannot invest in their children working 16 hours a day. You'll find children uh, walking among extremely hazardous machines. Uh, parents have actually given them uh, packets of chips so that they don't cry because productivity demands are so high that parents cannot attend to their children um, during the workday. <coughs> and this is just a photograph of a boiler machine in a large garment factory. And these are also in the industrial peripheries of the city. I forgot to mention that. Uh, and finally, the, l the last group is uh, those that live in rented rooms in Anjali Vistar, which is in the heart of the city. Uh, these are OBC and general caste headloaders and domestic workers that live in 10 by 10 rented rooms uh, with one family per room, so typically four to five members in a 10 by 10 space. Um, and their logic of survival is, is vastly different from the previous two groups as well. Um, through their forward caste or relatively forward caste status, they have accessed stronger social networks and better paying jobs in the city. Uh, and on interviewing them, they actually said that they've invested uh, in properties in the industrial peripheries, which is where Adivasis live, uh, rented out those properties and acquired additional sources of income. And in doing so, they have you know, developed some kind of semi-permanent presence in the city. Uh, and you know, use this to build domicile documents in a way that Adivasi families cannot. Um, yeah. I think for lack of time, I'm going to skip this. Um, so what does this all mean? You know, I, I, I demonstrated the evidence uh, to highlight just the vast heterogeneity and diversity uh, not just in terms of identity and occupational category, but also in terms of the logic of survival that people have in the city. Um, we realize that, however, across the board, people rely on dynamic and complex informal networks to access public provisioning, be that water, sanitation, uh, food, or even housing. Um, and the people that they negotiate with are themselves what some might call the marginalized category of urban poor. Right? You have uh, circular migrants negotiating with security guards who some might categorize as urban poor. Uh, Kirana Dukanwalas. Uh, you have uh, railway authorities who stand outside the railway quarters and guard it, right? Uh, and these are relationships of simultaneous patronage and exploitation. Uh, and, you know, like the example suggested, the tolls are immense, physical, mental, uh, and emotional. And actually, the extraction of the laboring body uh, is perhaps the most intimate site of capitalist exploitation because it is only through the extraction uh, be it of wages, be it of public provisioning from the most marginalized, that India can sustain its current growth model and remain competitive in global value chains, which is something that Nivedita kind of alluded to uh, at the start. Oh, sorry. 
Um, it's also not that informality is, is limited to the poor. The elite have their own kinds of informality, but those are different because they are often legitimized and, and, and seen, as, as, yeah, seen as legitimate. But the informalities of the poor, and particularly of circular migrants, are delegitimized and often criminalized. Right? We, have, uh, we had women telling us during interviews that railway authorities pelt stones at them. Uh, for defecating in the open, which is becoming increasingly common as the narrative of uh, open defecation-free cities comes to permeate our large uh, uh, urban areas. Uh, neighborhood societies, because of aesthetic reasons, will clog the water sources of circular migrants living in the open uh, because they just don't want them there. And we actually had state uh, officials saying that uh, laborers are criminals and they should not be here. Uh, the municipal corporation said that they are not tax-paying residents and and we have no accountability to them, but should rather go to industry to, to make these demands. But the irony of this all is that the very state that tells circular migrants to, to make demands from industry uh, gives them tax incentives and weakens labor regulations, as we saw with the passage of the four labor codes uh, three months ago, uh, which means that the circular migrant um, falls through the cracks of both state provisioning and industry provisioning. Uh, and this is necessary both for state and industry, uh, once again, to uh, to keep India competitive in global value chains through the extraction of the laboring body. Uh, just to quickly speak about what um, the evidence and analysis, what kind of implications it had both for our work as well as maybe uh, uh, can be applied generally as well. Uh, firstly, we, uh, when talking about uh, interventions in urban policy and planning, while we keep an eye to aggregation and categorization and sort of building universal principles, what we also realized is that it's very important along with citywide policies, along with national policies to look at place-based interventions and by this we mean uh, uh, different groups of people uh, occupying a space, the infrastructure in the space and the dynamic relationships between these. Um, and uh, allowing this to kind of be contextualized within the legacy of institutionalized power, oppression and exclusion in that space and uh, kind of be able to then embed praxis and demands in the heterogenic uh, kind of logics of the poor and how they negotiate access to a basic standard of living in highly informal settings. Um, we also found uh, the frame of flexibilization of labor, wage crisis in terms of employment in, um, uh, 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 in urban growth centers to sort of uh, be very important frames of analysis when looking at urban theory. Uh, and uh, this kind of helps build then an expression of migrants' interests that are politically, uh, that we can politically articulate as rights. Uh, speaking of migrants' rights, uh, we also um, look at the argument for universal social rights because uh, this is an important way to move beyond uh, bureaucratic fixes to who is an eligible uh, who is eligible as a migrant to access uh, certain provisioning uh, and we uh, uh, we kind of argue that social rights should be delinked from the idea of domiciliary and the official proof of residence and the idea of the permanent resident who's building permanent claims in the city uh, because this kind of categorization and enumeration is deeply embedded in the principles of governmentality it sort of helps us avoid the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria and uh, identifying eligible migrants in a in a category that's so dynamic, complex, and heterogeneous. And since the state is not going to take up this responsibility, the burden of that kind of uh, proof of documentation is always going to be falling on the poor, for which uh, universal social rights is a fix. It also helps us kind of reconcile the contestations between this homogenized category of urban <laughs> poor, as Raghav was talking about, with uh, between the security guard and the migrant, who is more eligible or less eligible, who has access to more resources or not. Uh, to speak in terms of uh, the idea that everybody occupying a certain space has the right to basic consumption. Thank you. Shall we move on to the next presentation, please?
Okay, sir. Uh, both Bangalore and Ahmedabad being major cities who have been undergoing what has been called a kind of neoliberal um, transformation over the last two or three decades um, have probably um, very similar characteristics in terms of <coughs> economic restructuring and, and changes in the labor market. <coughs> I'm going to talk as much as I can, and if my voice collapses, her feet is going to take over. Um, so um, this paper is based on a study that we recently completed um, we, where we looked at um, skill training, uh, labor, and uh, migration into Bangalore's service economy. <coughs> Um, and where we explore changing patterns of migration um, and work in Bangalore, um, focusing particularly on what has been called the new service economy. Um, and so obviously the service economy is quite a vast segment and the, the largest segment of, um, of uh, cities' econ economies today. Um, but here we're looking at the kind of services that have become um, uh, corporatized over time in the sense that even though most services such as transport, um, you know, house cleaning, um, um, and so on, are, and retail are, um, <coughs> are still within the so-called informal economy. We have a growing uh, corporate or organized sector for, for the provision of services. And we were interested particularly in um, the people who work in these so-called organized um, services. Um, in this paper, we, we looked at a gamut of, of sectors, but in this paper we're focusing on the work we did on, on the retail sector or big retail. Um, <coughs> so with the growth of organized services such as hospitality, can you just, um, sorry, go back. I haven't got what I'm going to do. With the growth of, of, um, of organized services in areas such as hospitality, big retail, transportation, beauty, um, and so on, um, there is a kind of a dominant um, discourse within the corporate sector that these um, kinds of um, businesses have created new kinds of jobs, better paying jobs, and in organized sector jobs, which is providing a kind of pathway, new pathways for um, uh, economic mobility for educated youth. Um, and we all know that what kind of workers, can you just flip, what kind of workers we're talking about, whether it's Uber drivers or, you know, Swiggy delivery boys or, you know, um, uh, workers in the mall, etc. So these are um, people who are very visible in the city and yet there's hardly any studies of this particular category of, 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 of the labor force. So we were interested to know, like, who are they, where do they come from, what is the nature of the work that they perform. Um, and how do they experience life in the city um, if they are indeed migrants? <coughs> and we're also interested in understanding how the growth of, of, of um, the so-called new service economy has reshaped the city itself and, and vice versa. Um, so the broader background is of course um, the, uh, the larger shift in terms of the Indian economy from um, towards um, the tertiary sector, towards services. Um, this is something that all of us know about, um, this is, which has taken place um, in the three decades or so after liberalization, where there's been a pattern of deindustrialization, a concomitant growth in terms of services such that something like 54% of GDP is now um, in the tertiary sector, and yet there has not been a corresponding growth in terms of employment, um, which is around 30% today. And as I said, of course, most employment in the service sector is in the unorganized, unorganized sector, but we have the growth of, of organized services also, which is what I'm interested in here. Um, so um, the setting of the study is also important because um, in Bangalore today, biggest share of employment um, is in services sector, um, and not just you know, IT and BPOs, which is what everyone talks about, but retail, hospitality, banking, and financial services real estate, transportation, security, and so on. Um, and so the larger setting of this study is also the city's kind of reinvention um, as a center of the tech industries and where it very rapidly shifted from having a quite an important manufacturing base and a large, um, or at least a decent size and stable um, industrial working class um, to, to um, a situation where a lot of industrial workers have lost their jobs and, and we have the rise of services as a kind of um, substitution for that. Um, so we, in this paper, we're focusing particularly on retail because it's one of the biggest sectors in terms of services and it's supposed to be a growing and dynamic sector 
um, which would um, is supposed to imply uh, we're supposed to provide an increasing um, in amount of employment um, in the future. Um, so, um, in terms of the study we did, it's it's a this is a very this is one segment of this larger study, and, and in this particular segment. Um, in this, in this segment of the study, um, uh, it's what I'm talking about here today is based on interviews with about 32 retail workers, um, most of whom were employed in different stores in, in a particular mall, most of which were done by by Harpreet here. Um, and obviously, we can't say too much about the retail workforce based on such a small sample, but. I think you know the the kinds of insights we got from talking to these workers does give us some uh, pointers to um, questions that we might want to pursue in looking at um, the service workforce. So one thing is that it seems to have um, it seems to ha be gendered in the sense that um, majority of workers, larger percentage of workers, would be women. Um, it's a very young workforce, and um, in the case of the of the cohort that we picked up, about half of them were migrants, and I don't know we don't we don't have data which would tell us what percentage of the workforce in the city as a whole are migrants versus people who were born in Bangalore. Um, but it seems like quite a quite a big chunk of them are indeed migrants. Um, what was interesting about um, the migrant um, uh, workers that we spoke to is that, again, in contrast to the kinds of informal sector workers that we just heard about, who normally come from landless um, rural families who do, do not have very high levels of education and so are getting you know, um, uh, plugged into the, the lower sectors of the, of the informal economy in the cities, here we have um, a group of people who come all of the, the households of the workers that we interviewed um, own some land, but small amounts of land. So they come from agricultural families. And they come from families who are not, um, they're not, certainly not BPL, not very well off in something in between in the sense that they could afford to educate at least one of their children up to 10th or 12th. Um, the basic um, qualification for working in retail stores is 10th standard, and all of our um, um, respondents had 10th, and many of them were, were 12th standard or above. So, some of them had college or even postgraduate degrees. Um, so, um, so we have migrants who came from rural areas or other small towns of Karnataka and other states. Um, and here we find also a story of agrarian distress very often. So just like other informal sector workers, where we know that the ag agricultural crisis has been pushing people out of the villages and into the city, even in the case of families who own land and who, who have been able to invest in some education for their children, we find a similar kind of a story going on. But of course, they are plugging into a very different segment of, of the labor market. Um, in terms of the non-migrant workers, um, their parents were mostly working class. Either um, they were industrial workers, worked, I mean, worked in factories or worked in various kinds of informal sector or, or self-employed kinds of jobs. So they're coming out of the working class. And the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because these kinds of jobs, whether like in large retail stores like Shop with Stop or in malls um, or similar kinds of, um, you know, back office um, types of work are often represented as aspirational, as the kinds of employment that if you get, you can actually be on a kind of trajectory of social mobility. And what, so therefore, they, these are young people who have got some amount of education. They are certainly are moving out of the class from which they came from to some extent. But the question is whether these kinds of jobs are actually going to provide a real path, uh, pathway of economic mobility, which is what we wanted to look at. <coughs> So what we actually found um, from the larger study, um, where we looked at drivers, retail, um, beauty and wellness sector, and other similar kinds of service jobs, is that um, what we really see in, in the service economy in Bangalore is really the form formation of what I'm calling a peripatetic labor force, in the sense that even though they are you know, uh, um, you know, technically employed by large corporate organizations, again, like Shopper Star, Big Bazaar, or you know Uber. Or of course, Uber is not employment per se. Um, they, these are not stable jobs. These are not by no means permanent jobs, and these are jobs that do not really have any kind of a career path attached to them. And because of the nature of employment and the nature of instability um, within this, these kinds of um, jobs. Um, workers very often change jobs. Within six months or one year, you find them hopping from one shop to another, one mall to another, one type of work to another, looking for you know at least a better salary, slightly better working conditions. Um, 
And so we documented the work histories of our cohort, and this is exactly what it reflects, is that hardly anyone stays in a job for more than six months, one year, two years. Um, you would have to do a, a much longer term study to really find out what happens to these people after a few years. Um, but the larger picture is of this very kind of unstable, um, highly mobile um, workforce where there is very little um, um, kind of possibility of, of having a permanent or a long-term um, 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 employment in, in these sectors. Um, what are the reasons for this or for what's been called, what in the industry is called the problem of attrition? Well, management, from the management perspective, um, Basically, because especially in retail, there aren't any particular qualifications you need for the job. Basically, anyone with a 10th standard uh, education could walk into the mall, walk into the store, apply and get the job. Um, and so uh, there's a large pool of these kinds of educated youth who are always available to get into the workforce. Um, and so because of that, basically, this is not exactly what managers say, but this is what they imply. They have no real interest in investing in training or in trying to um, you know, invest in their workforce so that they can have a longer term and a kind of a upward career uh, trajectory um, in the organization um, because there's always more people waiting for the job. So it's easier for them to just let people keep on you know, like rotating out and bring in new, new workers rather than actually invest in training and creating a more stable permanent workforce and, and a skilled workforce. Um, and so um, part of the argument is that, is that you know, um, these companies actually benefit from having this really large pool of labor and this very kind of flexible um, and um, uh, you know, constantly mobile workforce. Um, from employee um, point of view, there's, there's a number of reasons why they change jobs frequently. One of them has to do with compensation. In the industry, you often hear people say that people will change jobs for just another 500 rupees. I don't know to what extent this is true. But the fact is that they find salaries quite low um, compared to the kinds of cost of living that they have to bear living in the city. Um, most of these workers are people who are there in the workforce because their families have financial um, needs and they want to contribute to the, to, the, to the household, whether it's back in the village or in Bangalore. Um, but after you know, paying the cost of living in the city, which I'll come back to in a minute, and especially in terms of housing, it is very difficult for them to save anything on salaries, which are around 11, 12,000 rupees a month, plus incentives, but minus um, various kinds of um, you know, um, deductions for various reasons. Um, and so one is salary, one has to do with the nature of the, of the employment conditions themselves, where very often at least half of the people we spoke to did not even have a, a, an offer letter or a, a, a proper contract. So you know, what this reflects is what's been called a kind of precaritization or informalization of work within the corporate sector itself. So even though um, these large um, you know, big retail shops look like a formal sector organizations, in fact, the workforce is highly informalized. Um, then uh, there were other issues that people talked about, like you know, very long working hours, going beyond statutory hours, um, difficult working conditions, a lot of work pressure, a lot of um, very kind of um, regimented panoptical um, um, uh, management um, practices, which they found oppressive. Um, so um, there were a lot of complaints about um, about you know, the nature of work itself, but many of these uh, workers really felt stuck in the job because they felt that with the kind of qualifications or experience they had or did not have, there weren't very many other options for them. So one thing which we heard very often from people when we asked them about, like, do you envision a future for yourself in retail? You know, do you want to make a career in this type of work? Um, they would often say, like, there is no future in retail. There's no future for me here. So very few people could imagine themselves actually acquiring some amount of knowledge or skill and moving into a team leader or kind of a managerial role. They felt that those kinds of roles were reserved for other kinds of people. Um, so, um, so then what is it that, that these um, retail workers actually aspire for? Why are they there? Are they going to remain stuck in these jobs forever? Um, Again, one would have to do a different type of study to find that out, but, but by and large, what we found is that um, they do have very much aspirations for social mobility. They do have a kind of a vision for the future, which involves getting into a better kind of a job, especially what's called an office job or an AC job, right? A, a job which allows you to sit down in front of a computer instead of standing on your feet the whole day. Um, many of them aspire to complete their education or further their education in hopes of getting a better job. 
Um, and so they see retail um, sales jobs as kind of a stopgap or kind of a stepping stone to a better kind of a, of a uh, employment, um, thinking that they can get some skills at least, um, pick up, you know, improve their spoken English, pick up some type of customer service skills and so on, um, and, and then move into something else, which again accounts for the kind of very rapid turnover that you see in these organizations. Okay, my time is up. I will just um, quickly flag the last issue. Maybe we can come back in the discussion. I wanted to link this picture of the retail workforce or more broadly the workforce in the, in, in the new service economy in Bangalore um, to the question of the city itself. And this, this links to what was also being discussed in the, in the last paper. Um, this comes from a different project that we were doing on Bangalore, which looks at changing um, changes in um, in older working class neighborhoods and, and informal settlements, um, which are located close to where very large mega projects have come up, including the mall where Harpreet did all this work. Um, and here what we find very interesting is the emergence of a new kind of a rental economy, where um, workers or residents who were, for many of them formerly factory workers, who own their own very small plots or homes, are building up on those um, structures in order to create rental accom accommodation. And that rental accommodation is not catering to the, you know, the poorest of the informal sector workers who would be in the kind of settlements you spoke about, but it's catering to these kind of people, retail workers, security guards working in the malls, um, other kinds of people who have, you know, these kinds of jobs in the in the say, you know, ten to fifteen to twenty thousand kind of range, um, and so we, the retail workers we spoke to live either, you know, sharing flats like this. Most of them are either are, are actually unmarried, and so um, they share, um, you know, these small flats with their colleagues, or they live, you know, sharing in PG accommodation, which also has seen this huge explosion in Bangalore. Um, so um, here, what I'm interested in kind of maybe building on here is, is drawing linkages between changes in the nature of the property market and the nature of housing itself. How do people actually um, access housing and accommodation? And the new rental economy, which has emerged, which actually provides a very important source of income to these older, these residents of older neighborhoods who now have lost their own sources of, of livelihood, right? And so there's all these kind of um, interesting entanglements between the growth of these kind of neoliberal consumption spaces like malls, the workforces that are, the workers who are working there, and then the, the nature of the neighborhoods around them where they're, you know, kind of re, um, restructuring themselves in order to provide housing. Um, so I guess I should stop here. There's a short conclusion, but um, basically I guess the point is that what we see in Bangalore, which needs a lot more work, and I think not just Bangalore, of course, all the, the kind of these, that's just pictures of the housing. It needs a lot more work in terms of trying to understand really and, and profile the, these new um, labor forces that are emerging in, in the metro cities in India, where we really have very little information. We know something about informal sector workers, construction workers. We know a lot about highly qualified IT professionals, et cetera. But this in-between class, which is really growing very rapidly, um, which seems to, again, like, like many informal sector um, circular workers, is, not, is often not able to settle down in the city, precisely because they, they are priced out of the housing market. So there are questions here about access to housing, you know, in, in uh, inequality and access to housing, um, uh, you know, which are very much linked to the question of labor and the kind of working conditions which um, the, this um, sector of, of, of workers are, um, are um, stuck inside. So um, my last sentence is, while the worlding of Bangalore <coughs> has served the affluent and upper middle class as well with lucrative corporate jobs and high-end apartment complexes, the needs of the large number of mainly migrant workers who provide the labor for the consumption-oriented new service economy have been largely ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the Next presentation, Alicia. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, the paper is titled Interstate Migrants Policy Bias in Network Enabled Access to City Spaces. And uh, it's a social network analysis on interstate migrant workers in Bangalore. 
my uh, co-panelist Harshit Garg was supposed to be here, but he couldn't make it. Hence, uh, I will present for the both of us. Mm. Yeah, okay, uh, so I'll begin with uh, a definition of uh, who an interstate migrant workman is. Uh, and this applies to all of the formal policy networks that we'll be looking at. Uh, so uh, this is according to the Interstate Migrant Workmen Act, which was uh, of 1979. So according to that, uh, any person who is recruited by a contractor and who is working in a state uh, which is other than the state in which he or she was uh, enumerated would become a migrant, an interstate migrant workman. Uh, so uh, before I begin, I'd, I'd like to also say that uh, this is a very preliminary project. It's a project in progress. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to uh, a lot of suggestions. Um, and we're open to suggestions, especially methodological suggestions. So uh, yeah. So uh, these are the research questions that we're mainly looking at. Uh, so firstly, with the influx of interstate migrant workmen in Bangalore, uh, how are urban spaces being reconfigured? Uh, secondly, we'll look at formal policy networks and informal networks of interstate migrant workers in Bangalore and a sort of network well or a gap that is created between the two. Uh, and uh, do these networks enable the incorporation of information and cooperation capital and to what extent? And we'll come to this as we progress. Yeah. Uh, so for the conceptual framework, uh, I'm uh, borrowing uh, Manuel Castells and uh, his sociological network society. So essentially, I'm not looking at institutions, but at networks and at network flows. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and especially networks in cities, so the levels of urban interactions, uh, which allows uh, people in communities, different languages, marginalized communities, and well-off communities to exist in a city together uh, without really having to socially interact. So, um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, as for the methodology, uh, and this becomes one of the most important parts, uh, we're looking at network methodologies and uh, how this would allow a point of entry into uh, the formal and informal networks of interstate migrant workmen in Bangalore. And we're also looking at uh, small, uh, micro, small and medium uh, sector enterprises uh, because uh, there are a lot of studies that are uh, centered around the larger uh, industrial units but uh, uh, with a lot of the laws what happens is uh, the laws are applicable to people uh, who employ uh, migrant workmen or uh, five or more migrant workmen so what happens to interstate migrant work workmen who are say working in uh, smaller industries and smaller numbers do the laws protect them at all uh, so we're using social network analysis and uh, because it's a very quantitative method, uh, we also thought that we could incorporate uh, semi-structured in-depth interviews to understand how uh, information flows between the two, between the nodes that we're looking at. So uh, as for uh, within, we're looking at social capital there. So there's cooperation capital. Uh, where you look at the network's ability uh, to facilitate interactions. So essentially, uh, how the network facilitates cooperation between interstate migrant workmen. And information capital, uh, which is you're looking at how uh, the social network enables access to information. So uh, emerging from education and, uh, and uh, maybe ending at the access to uh, policy networks, uh, to language, uh, language barriers, all of that. Uh, so, um, yeah, and um, um, we're looking at social capital is, uh, we're looking at it as utility. Uh, so we'll, uh, the agent here is your migrant workman and uh, the total utility that is derived from say a network G, um, which is the migrants network. Uh, and the, uh, the combination of it is uh, the combined utility would be the utility derived from the uh, information capital and the cooperation capital and what comes out of the combination of the two. Yeah, and uh, as for methodology for the formal uh, policy network, we're looking at policy analysis and identifying actors. So also including uh, social networks, but uh, we're looking uh, at it through a policy analysis lens. And uh, we've used uh, snowball sampling for the most part. Uh, and we're also looking at areas outside Bangalore, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, as we progress, we'll know why. 
and there are a lot of methodolo- methodological challenges and that's why this remains at a preliminary stage uh, so uh, as we know the census released its uh, uh, migration uh, data very recently it came out very recently despite the fact that um, it, it was in 2011 it's almost 2020 and yeah so and also uh, in the interviews that we did take uh, migrants were extremely hesitant in uh, providing information because again they belong to uh, the uh, micro medium small enterprises and they didn't have the kind of network uh, the huge networks that would um, support and would allow for support and cooperation okay so the formal policy network it falls within the labor ministry government of india uh and uh, these are the acts that uh, i i derive the uh, we derive the actors from so you have your uh, interstate migrant workmen act of 1979 uh within which you have your uh, the central rules and as well as the rules that are applicable to karnataka uh and also according to all of these all of the above uh the uh, act becomes applicable uh to provisions under the payment of wages act the minimum wages act and the workmen compensation act but all of this w- uh, will be subsumed into the code uh, that ke- uh, that came out in uh, 2019 that was proposed in 2019 um okay so this is the formal policy uh, network we will look at the informal policy network in a bit but um so you have your chief deputy labor commissioner it starts with that there is a labor office and you have your for every district uh, and you have your licensing registry officer your principal employer contractor and your migrant worker and all of the provisions within the act uh, say provision of canteens a uh, crash uh and uh provision of uh um 1.1 uh, square meter uh space for each migrant all of that is applicable to the migrant worker but if we look at it through information and cooperation uh what happens is uh, that the principal employer uh interacts with your uh licensing registering officer he also interacts with the contractor and the contractor is a huge actor in this network and all of the benefits is supposed to trickle down to the migrant worker but it doesn't because the migrant worker has um has no contact at all with either of the actors above and all of the actors form the policy network but there really is no interaction for the migrant worker who remains outside of the policy network so um the um formal policy network really does not support the um, migrant worker at all uh and the tensions um so in this case uh why would uh why would a migrant worker working for this small uh, small scale industries demand for uh, any kind of protection from the government at all because towards the end uh, in implementation there is no contact there is no direct contact at all there is no information flow and there is no cooperation uh, capital either uh, provided in the formal policy uh, network and again the contractor really has no incentive uh, to register and allow migrant workers to be registered and uh, give them protection uh, because the contractor then becomes liable for all the medical issues of the migrant and of the families of the migrants uh, and uh, they uh, say uh, they're supposed to maintain a passbook registering all of the uh, work that uh, the migrant has done and the wages for it but again um, would the migrant really be uh, able to uh, give him his or her literacy levels uh, would they be able to um, uh, say in case of violations would they be able to appeal to a court or appeal to the uh, appellate officer in that case at all um what is the point of the passbook and uh, even uh, and you have to provide canteens and cra- and crashes and all of that so why would a contractor what is the incentive for the contractor to um uh, to approach uh, a registering office the labor commissioner and register so um but uh, i think one of the most important parts of the formal net formal policy network uh, is the uh, grievance redressal so in case there is a violation of the rights the um, the uh, interstate migrant workman he has the option to uh, go to the appellate officer and to uh, gain a grievance redressal for the violations for the uh, uh, yeah for the violations so uh, i think the form policy network becomes especially important here okay um but overall um, from the work uh, from the policy analysis we realized that the formal policy network at least as so far as information capital is concerned and cooperation capital is concerned is not efficient at all um 
Yeah, so these are the housing policies because we're looking at city spaces. Uh, you have your Interstate uh, Migrant Workmen Act. Uh, we discussed all of this. And the time bound, uh, okay, okay, I'll skip this. So the, uh, this is the informal network. Um, in the informal network, uh, informal networks are formed in between the migrants. So I when you have your formal networks fail, uh, you have what are called informal networks. And uh, in that, you have your contractor, manager, supervisor, and migrant workman. And these and the principal employer, etc., do not feature in it at all uh, because they are formed informally. Uh, here, um, yeah. So um, in India, a lot of the migration is uh, the pattern is chain migration. So uh, the way that a migrant gets to a city is because he has he or she has contacts in the city, and uh, uh, and hence an older migrant allows a new migrant to come in, and that's how you form um, you form uh, informal networks. Um, okay, so from the interviews that we did and from the preliminary social network analysis, uh, language barriers in a city like Bangalore. Uh, so uh, all of the migrants found that because they were all coming from the same social network and in an uh, in uh, an MSME, because you have like a small number of uh, migrants working and they're from the same community, and we're looking at a lot of migrants from Bihar. Uh, and in a place that we uh, looked at, there were about six migrants residing. They found solace in the fact that everybody there spoke the same language. And even if they were occupying um, the same room, they at least had that uh, community uh, connection to um, fall back on. Uh, yeah, and uh, respondents, they chose to work in the city of Bangalore. Bangalore became a very important uh, um, uh, point of attraction uh, per se because uh, again uh, we we interviewed a few people in Krishnagiri and uh, what happened there is that despite the fact that Krishnagiri is about 91 kilometers away from Bangalore uh, the people in the factories uh, they said without being prompted that they were uh, they they were working in Bangalore and they traveled all around India and they found that Bangalore was one of the uh, most um, uh, liked spaces, the, the space that they uh, liked working in. And now there's another policy, um, uh, it's a uh, proposal uh, in 2020 where the uh, where Karnataka would introduce 50 to 70 percent reservation for Kandigas. So now we will look at how this would affect uh, and this will this will be introduced on January twentieth, uh, uh, twenty twenty, and we'll look at how this affects the idea of informal policy networks, which are sustaining a lot of these people. Um, okay, yeah, these are the social networks of the migrants, and the second and the third one are especially applicable to uh, in everything that we've worked on so far. Uh, in the second one, uh, the migrant B. Uh, also uh, knows two people in the city who also know each other and then there you have a cooperation uh, network and uh, uh, and uh, uh, information capital network and similarly uh, with C uh, you have somebody back home who knows somebody in Bangalore who then would uh, introduce you so that you the migrant workman can move to Bangalore um, yeah. Uh, so Karnataka government uh, pushes for a law to reserve 70 to 75 percent for blue collar workers, and uh, the potential uh, the potential threat that it could have to the so uh, to the uh, community uh, uh, community connections that are formed by the informal uh, uh, workers, the sorry the migrant workmen. Um, okay. Uh, so here uh, um, and. Uh, parallel to the actual figures, we're looking at, uh, um, say, uh, uh, 10 factories and uh, in which you have uh, uh, 30 um, uh, migrant labor and uh, the rest of your local labor. Now, if there are no reservations and with the failure of formal networks, what happens is, uh, and given the contractors and the social networks, local labor is concentrated in one area, which is your red, and migrant labor is usually concentrated in the other factories, each MSME, and each line represents each factory, uh, this, uh, small scale factories. Uh, and so they, they, they um, work together, and hence there are these community ties, and they don't feel the barriers that emerge from your, um, uh, say, your language barriers, your social barriers, uh, all of that. Um, now, if you introduce your job quota, the 70, 50 to 75 percent reservation, uh, now the social networks cannot sustain in this case, especially with the tens that we're looking at, the uh, social network cannot sustain the migrant workmen and the local labor separately. So now you have 
uh, in each factory you'd have uh, seven uh, uh, seven men and women um, or from local labor and you'd have uh, three migrant workmen and again the the uh, the level uh, of the possibility of being isolated increases manifold so uh, yeah in uh, conclusion yeah, in conclusion uh, we're looking at the importance of the informal networks and how in the absence of the formal networks especially given that the grievance address was the only was the only um, good point that emerged from the formal networks anyway uh, how important the informal networks are and how they could um, uh, how how it becomes very very important for the migrant workmen and for any suggestions um, uh, I request suggestions regarding this and any methodological uh, intervention so thank you thank you Alicia now from everyday urban experiences of uh, migrant workers we are now moving to the uh, to another category of uh, 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 informal workers that are street based sex workers over here in bangalore so the study uh, or this paper is a part of a bigger urban transformation uh, experience of uh, Bangalore city and uh, while uh, securing the public space have become safer for acceptable or legitimate users and claimant of that space the undesirables are left to feel excluded harassed and unwanted in their everyday life so in this backdrop this study looks at a section of informal workers that is a street based sex workers and their everyday experiences narrate how they are more unequal uh, than the unequals in the city. So uh, this paper uh, contributes basically in three ways. One, it uh, captures the nar and narrates the everyday revengeist experiences of street-based sex workers in Bangalore city and it expands and enriches the geography of the discourse pertaining to urban neoliberalism and its associated revengeism to uh, the global south. and. It then depicts the ongoing struggles for their human rights and citizenship. Uh, the study uh, seeks supports from uh, two conceptual vantage points. One is neoliberal urbanism and urban revanchism. While understanding the city in the contemporary era, neoliberal urbanism as a concept provide doorway to interpreting Contemporary urban restructuring, rescaling, reconstitution, and mutation. So, neoliberal urbanism has had an extensive academic treatment. However, the key point drawn from the literature, which I comments in this paper, is that not only does neoliberal urbanism affect cities, cities in fact themselves also become key institutional arena in and through which neoliberalism evolves. So it is visible that much of the discourses surrounding neoliberal urbanism may be immediately allude to mega cities of the West or global North. However, its southern incarnation is visible in India. For instance, uh, studies have shown how Mumbai neatly fits into the standard narrative of urban neoliberalism and related sp spatial governmentality and exclusionary policies. So in this backdrop, a particular moment of urban development, that is revengeism, associated with urban neoliberalism serves as a valuable concept as it been often employed as a basis of justification for urban gentrification. The revengeist thesis, a term first coined by urban geographer Neil Smith in 90s, is based on the spatial and economic processes and exclusions observed in New York City during that era. Smith's definition of a uh, revenge city uh, refers to uh, revenge against minorities, the working class, women, sex workers, squatters, graffiti artists, environmental activists, gays and lesbians and so on. 
So attacks on affirmative action and immigration policies, street violence against gays, homeless people, feminist bashing, public campaigns against political correctness and multiculturalism were the most visible vehicles of this reaction. I know we are quite familiar with all this <laughs> in today's world. So in a sense, revengeism uh, cannot the uh, vengeance of uh, cities intent on eradicating undesirable population in order to create a positive image. Uh, so this revengeism in a way host uh, a fundamental battle over space hence marks a distinctive policy formulation related to notions of public space uh, such as streets, parks, public toilets, pay areas and so on to secure these spaces from poor minorities and progressive movements. This paper hence uh, explores the nature and impact of revenge policies in the everyday life and work experience of this category of informal workers. So now coming to the uh, field and the people, uh, so Bangalore is characterized with uh, street-based sex work across the city as opposed to sex work being concentrated in certain identify parts or red light areas. And Thanks to this, is ac actually expand the scope of surveillance, visibility, exposure, and general geographic presence of these workers across the urban spaces. Uh, I basically analyzed the experience uh, of these workers over the last two decades, which have been dramatically transformational for... Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, do I have to start again? <laughs> so the experience over the last two uh, uh, decades, which have been dramatically transformational for Bangalore, capturing the imagination of those seeking a modern and resurgent India. Uh, street-based, now who are the street-based sex workers? Street-based sex workers perform in the institutional setting of street uh, economy, soliciting their customers at public venues, bus stands, railway stations, cinema halls and highways and perform sex work at locations such as lodges or secluded public areas without regular third party mediation. And the sex workers have uh, anyway historically faced routine removal from spaces associated with more respectable populations and they remain as one of the most vulnerable and historically stigmatized sections of informal labor. <laughs> Even all individuals are apparently equal in the eyes of the law and the state, the sex workers in their everyday experience of urban space face social stigma for failing to match the ideas of how a good citizen should act and are demoted to as the other, the second class citizen, not only by the state but also by the decent and respectable. Uh, British geographer Phil Hubbard's studies provide a detailed account of the, uh, the hostility that sex workers have had to face in their everyday encounters with urban space. Other studies have also identified the emergence of punitive policy policies designed to exclude sex workers from urban centers and these punitive measures interestingly enjoys a good level of popular support uh, in its wider attempt to cleanse the public space. Now, coming to my method, so as I mentioned, uh, this, this was a uh, you know, larger or a bigger study. So the field work was over 18 months among five dozen street-based sex workers in Bangalore city and a half a dozen of organizations supporting them. And uh, by Bangalore city, what we meant is uh, majestic, the major, the main city points that is majestic, KR market and MG road. And uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, or in-depth interviews were done with uh, men, women and transgender workers. However, we acknowledge that uh, diverse practices, gender expressions and sexual identities play a distinct role in the livelihood strategies of men, women and transgender uh, workers. Uh, we, uh, while collecting information uh, following Kamath, uh, we seek long, we didn't actually seek uh, long uh, oral histories, rather we were looking at uh, micro histories, that is oral accounts of uh, 20 years, much shorter than their entire lifetime. So for this paper, uh, the study, so uh, the whole, the, the, book, the entire study actually uh, collect all this information and we were trying to collectively evolve their narratives. For this paper, the, I then bring out a sketch of urban revengeist experiences by this workers. Uh, however, the paucity of an entirely accurate chronological everyday account of this section of workers uh, was, uh, you know, it was uh, paucity and then the inaccessibility or absence of FAR 
also scanty academic work on street based sex workers in bangalore made the secondary material important uh, which further prodded me to look at newspaper reports and media narratives over two decades so new newspaper reports were followed chronologically this was then appended by other reports by various organization this uh, uh, attempt actually uh, helped us to gain further clarity on the primary oral narratives we have collected from sex workers in their everyday life cycles uh, and in this process it was bangalore based organization called sangama which was giving support to sexual sex workers and sexual minorities they have a uh, very good uh, archival uh, account of this newspaper and other media reports that that was really useful in this exercise so in this process special care was given to inform and privacy verbal consent was sought before conducting the interviews audio recordings were avoided that's where uh, the role of the research assistant was very important and uh, we took down handwritten notes as much as possible no identifying information was collected and workers were ensured anonymity throughout the study now let me move on to my everyday everyday revengeist experiences uh, so this when i look at this everyday uh, experiences the study was mainly focusing on uh, the everyday surveillance and policing as one of its major revenge special uh, process that further perpetuates the marginalized status of this worker and for convenience especially for the presentation this uh, this everyday revenge just experiences was then under uh, categorized under certain themes and each one, let me tell you each let me take this bail that each one of this theme uh, itself is quite expansive and intricate but today i'll be just giving only a capsule <laughs> form of uh, some of these experiences uh, so while exploring this everyday experiences most of their narrative uh, started off from their private spaces when we focus on their private spaces one may wonder then whether they have right to their private spaces to beside public spaces police routinely target even their domestic space in the name of raids and uh, rescue mission with even their adult children criminalized in this process one sex worker narrated to us when they came home and started shouting at me accusing me of running a brothel naturally my kids too were exposed to the attention of our neighbors and local community how can i possibly want to run a brothel in the same house as my parents i have nowhere else to shift my house how do i show my face around uh, my locality now what do i tell my kids won't they be ridiculed by other children around another narrative bad enough they kept asking me embarrassing questions they even gave a suspicious look at my daughter and asked me whether i have plans for her to in future i was speechless <coughs> there have been cases of police barging into the houses of individuals belong to sexual minorities and asking them to vacate the place by publicly humiliating them Uh, now moving to public spaces while atrocities targeting them in private habitations bringing their own variety of humiliation attacks in urban public spaces take more extreme form they have routinely faced when these public spaces were subject to large scale transformation when they shrank or even disappear altogether crime towards them skyrocketed this has been increasingly the case in bangalore city over two decades our field work revealed narratives on police atrocities including public identification verbal abuse beating being chased around with baton and so on police officers would often publicly abuse them in obscene language or call out their name over loudspeakers thus humiliate them in public many of them are accosted on their way home or when merely running errands the police routinely confiscate their mobile phones which are then convenient tools of misuse and blackmail threatening family and other acquaintances when uh, this is quite interesting when sex workers approach the police if they are beaten or abused by their clients partners or any other parties their right to remedies is routinely denied by police and who refuse to lodge fir or investigate the act of violence often there is a mocking about how a sex worker could possibly be sexually threatened since provision of sexual service was their job in the first place 
In fact, sexual minorities in general have had to face flack for simply being present in public spaces or appearing as potential troublemakers to visitors. Transgender individuals are swiftly booked for robbery and theft, and attempts to complain against routine detention or extortion are met with further violence. Bangalore-based transgender activists are Padmashali related. Booking us under false case is not new. When I used to stand on roads in, year, in the year 2000, I ended up paying rupees 30 to them, that to the police, regularly. Whenever we failed to pay, they uh, so easily booked us under robbery, extortion and theft cases. Uh, now coming to the rescue and rehabilitation experiences, sex workers and their associated organization have related how there is a popular but unsound yet often chanted belief that all sex workers are trafficked individuals which is the basis of regular raids. And the women who are forced into, uh, so thanks to this uh, regular raids, these women, this mainly the sex workers are then moved into state run uh, or even NGO run shelter homes. And according to uh, another Bangalore based organization, Alternative Law Forum, women forced into rem remedial homes have no access to legal representation and their dignity is seriously compromised. State home shelters in Bangalore accommodate women who are homeless, who have faced domestic violence, who are abandoned, unwed and pregnant or mentally unsound with no guardian or other no guardian and of course this ITP that is Immoral Traffic Prevention Act uh, ITPA this women also that is those who are uh, arrested on the basis of sex you know those were sex workers so these women are housed together and often find each other's company extremely challenging shelters have also been criticized for being extremely unhygienic and the shelter home also cut off support system of sex workers be it family community based organization or friends which further isolate them now let's move on to the uh, last part that is uh, the legal flows. The root of the problem is that their rights being routinely compromised in blatant violation of the guidelines on arrest and custody laid down by National Human Rights Commission, which were witnessed during the rescue and rehabilitation practices. The biggest grievance that sex workers often brought up was the misuse of ITPA. The police routinely book sex workers under Section 8 of ITPA, which punishes soliciting, uh, and this has effectively undermined sex workers' ability to claim legal protection in public cities spaces. In 2014, Bangalore recorded 144 cases under at ITPA under the police's drive to clean the city and the police claimed that subsequently the number of sex workers had declined in places such as majestic bus station, city railway station and pedestrian subways. Uh, while uh, this act used to criminalize sex workers de facto within 200 meter meters, of, uh, meters uh, of any public space, Karnataka sex worker union members claim that uh, if you're using ITPA uh, as uh, the tool to actually criminalize us, practically every space on the street in a city like Bangalore is a public space within that definition and we appear as criminals everywhere. Over the uh, years, the police have also used a range of other strategies apart from ITPA that is frequently referred to Karnataka Police Act and uh, filing cases of nuisance and obstruction of duty against sex workers and also Karnataka Prohibition of Beggary Act and the sex workers after being picked up on this ground are then shipped to beggar home. Uh, sorry, one more thing <laughs> uh, that is the media, one more agent that is the new actor that work both independently as well as in collusion with police in revanchist operation is the television media, particularly vernacular language news, covering what they interpret as urban social issue requiring attention. In few instances, while sex workers were being rounded up by police uh, in the city centers, news channels were permitted to telecast the live coverage of arrest given the prime location of the city. Apart from issuing threats of physical violence or of arrest, the police also now threaten them to release the process of arrest along with their names and other details to television channels, which exponentially humiliate them. So with this, we can see that the everyday experiences of these workers for the show, how conformity has become an increasingly essential pre 
prerequisite to utilize and enjoy public space, with deviant individuals and group penalized through stigmatization and violence perpetrated by the state. So the last part of the paper, is, I have, as I had mentioned, is basically looking at the support system, which I won't be presenting here today. But this paper then reviews the ongoing endeavors that strengthen human rights and citizenship rights for these workers, with the lacuna left by the state's general impassivity. And the support system has emerged with a variety of actors coming on board over the last two decades or so, which I have uh, categorized in these, uh, majorly these four categories. Uh, uh, so, which maybe for during the discussion we can have, it, uh, we can look at this. And to conclude, in this manner, this paper not only pushes the Revenge City thesis to cover Bangalore City and in general the Global South, which has experienced proactive neoliberal urban transition, but also contributes to the chronicling of Indian metropolitan street-based sex work in terms of its marginalization as a consequence of urban transition. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Let's move on to the discussion part. Yeah. Uh, thanks for an thanks for a very interesting panel. I think uh, Niti's. Uh, conception of uh, urban revanchism actually finds echo in all the other papers that were presented before you, even though they did not articulate it explicitly, uh, what migrants and other marginalized groups face within the city. I have a few questions for, I have questions for uh, all the panelists basically. Uh, so for Nivedata and Raghav, uh, what would fair housing for circular migrants look like? in light of the uh, complexities of their existence that you've teased out in your paper, right? So, and ideally something that doesn't involve them staying in the open or defecating in the open or walking three kilometers, etc. cetera. Uh, and secondly, um, is there a way, if, if we were to take the municipal corporations argument forward of placing liability on employers in a manner that doesn't result in your other case study, which is workers living on the factory floor? Right, and maybe in some way setting those off against the incentives given to them, some carrot and stick kind of approach. Is that an imagination that you think might be possible? Uh, to Carol, uh, you you briefly mentioned the con you, that they have that uh, contract that uh, flimsy contracts uh, that these that these retail workers have. Uh, I was wondering whether you had a chance to look at these contracts and to I mean and how do um, employers and the workers see these contracts. Are they seen as legal documents with the possibility of some right, some uh, space for negotiation, or are they just like pieces of paper that are there uh, as a formality? Uh, and finally, for uh, Alicia, uh, where are the labor code, the new labor codes in your analysis? I'm asking this specifically because I think by the time you finish your research, the Interstate Migrant Workers Act would have been repealed. And the new labor codes, especially the ones on social security and the ones on occupation and working conditions might be an interesting, and the changes they bring about might be an interesting way of looking at uh, some of the analysis. Uh, the last bit of your, the last slide actually on the analysis of quotas for uh, local workers versus uh, interstate uh, versus migrant workers is an interesting uh, idea and I would suggest that like you sort of expand on that a little more uh, than the analysis of the law that you were doing pre previously. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your presentations. Just like uh, inviting some comments from Niti. Uh, uh, the thesis of uh, urban revenge in, in that sense against minorities uh, an extremely provocative one with very radical potentials. So just uh, from the idea of intersectionality, since you've spoken to all the sex workers, and I think I, may, I saw that you also spoken to transgender uh, <coughs> sex workers in that tribe. 
So just wondering if uh, the the transgenderedness of the sex workers or even a variable like caste in terms of these expressions of revenge and persecution and exclusion, did you find some intersectional commentary? If you have some thoughts on that, that would be nice. Um, this question is for Carol and Harpreet. Uh, was re was reading a paper on uh, retail mall workers set in Delhi, and over there the the the, the scholar Kaya Pardalai, she speaks about how certain bodies are more valued, uh, and in this case it was uh, women from the northeastern parts of India because uh, they are considered more global and more modern. Uh, in line with the kind of brands that these malls are selling. Uh, so I was wondering if there was something like that happening in, in Bangalore as well, because of you know the ideas that Bangalore sort of projects as a global city, um, and all these malls are, se are selling these brands. The other question was for Neeti. Uh, I think taking forward the question that was asked by the gentleman there, uh, in terms of when you walk around the city or when you look around the city, especially in the nights, you see also sort of a spatial segregation of sex workers. Uh, now in the past, we've had street-based sex workers tell us about how they used to stand, and these were local Canada, well, uh, state, uh, uh, women from the state, who said that we could stand in MG Road, but after the metro came, we were, we were shooed away from there. But a recent walk uh, in, in the night on MG Road showed me that now these spaces uh, are occupied or you see black women there uh, who, who do sex work and uh, so a lot of customers come there. You see Hebbar in the flyover there, mostly uh, transgender, transgender women and KR Market and the older parts of the city uh, populated more by um, sex workers who are, you know, so-called local. So I was just wondering, how this could play out in terms of solidarity amongst sex workers. I know it's a very, very sort of uh, divided group in terms of gender, sexual orientation, race even. Uh, so just, just your thoughts about that. more questions or is this it? We can answer these and see. Yeah, sure. about half of our respondents said they, they hadn't been given contracts and uh, the rest of them were um, uh, were, uh, were given contracts but even among them uh, most were not aware of uh, the entitlements um, that it ensured. Uh, deductions were made under uh, PF uh, and insurance and other heads. Uh, but uh, workers at least uh, didn't see it as enforceable. Um, yeah, that was what uh, was, yeah. Uh, so just to address the first question, um, the question was what would fair housing look like for uh, circular migrants? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, just following up on embracing the heterogeneity among this group, uh, I think what we've realized is that there is no one size fits all uh, solution. Um, and I'll just give you an example of that. Um, so the municipal corporation Ahmedabad uh, has launched Ren Baseras or night shelters basically <coughs> um, catered at uh, the homeless. Uh, but if you look at the first group that I mentioned, which is Adivasi families uh, who choose to live in the open or are compelled to live in the open uh, because of its proximity to a labor naka, right? A, a randomly placed uh, Ren Basera would completely flout their logic, um, completely undermine the social networks that they have um, in that area. Um, and so for a group like that, that's living in the open, I think the first step to do is to uh, prevent evictions and recognize their claim over that space. Uh, in, in Arjun Ashram, uh, people have reported being evicted, you know, up to once a month, twice a month. Um, they move a uh, hundred meters away and come back to that same space, which takes an enormous toll uh, on their bodies. Uh, so I think the first step 
for a place like open settlements would be to recognize the claim that migrants have over that space simply because like nivedita said uh, through the paradigm of universal social rights and citizenship that's delinked from domicility just by being there they have a claim over that space um so i don't think it necessarily takes the form of permanent structures because at least at least as a first step because that completely falls out of the logic of temporary claims and circularity that is so characteristic of these groups um yeah Uh, just to um, add on to what Raghav said, uh, I think um, the first step that we have to take is to be able to uh, fix liability on who should be responsible for uh, housing or public uh, kind of pro basic uh, standard of living of different groups, right? So, uh, and that also kind of answers the second question on uh, whether you know it's possible to place liability on employers. So that again depends on the size of the employer and um, how regular uh, the workforce is. For instance, with construction workers who actually prefer to uh, do daily wage work with different term um, kind of uh, contractors moving from site to site, it's very difficult to then uh, place employer liability. But with workers who are in uh, factories, possibly, but a lot of the workers, especially in the industrial peripheries of Narul, work in very small units with uh, employers who might also be uh, workers themselves or like who are almost petty contractors who are taking on subcontracted work. So there again, it becomes very difficult to place liability on employer. But uh, with larger construction sites, larger factories, this is possible. But again, given the kind of hollowing out of regulatory institutions of the state, uh, especially the labor department's kind of um, ability to uh, regulate standards in terms of, uh, for instance, the Building and Other Construction Workers Act kind of uh, uh, mandates that uh, housing be provided to workers, but it doesn't have uh, standards within the act on the basis of which uh, the labor department could then regulate. And again, the kind of under-resourcing and uh, dismantling of the regulation regime also makes that very difficult. So maybe that's something to work on. Um, with yeah, open space kind of settlements with uh, where employer liability can't be s placed, it has to be then a uh, claim on the state. And this can be through diverse narratives, right? Uh, uh, wh the narratives a lot of groups uh, in Vasana and Arjun Ashram have actually been making is uh, that since they're subsidizing the growth of the city, they have a right to remain in the space. And if they want to create temporary structures which make their lives easier, such as uh, temporary uh, toilets, uh, you know, temporary structures with where uh, women can kind of have a kind of have a safe space. Uh, so yeah, that kind of claim making has already happened. Uh, so yeah, trying to legitimize those narratives. Um. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I think uh, social networks. Uh, especially the informal social networks would be a um, better way of looking at the way capital circulates anyway. And uh, as for the question, you asked where the labor courts would be situated, right? Eh? Um, uh, so, uh, like you said, the uh, Interstate Migrant Workmen Act will be uh, repealed anyway. Um, the uh, I think one of the positive points about that was that the appellate officer and the uh, informal migrant workmen would have some kind of relationship. So that that is the only point of contact uh, within the formal policy network. Um, now the problem with the new code is also that you're homogenizing the category of labor itself. So uh, you know that the interstate migrant workmen would just fall through. Um, so in that case, the location of the court itself becomes precarious and uh, re a grievance redressal becomes even more uh, problematic. So I think in this case, um, the informal social network is the only avenue that remains. And I think the informal network also becomes important because it also becomes the space for, uh, it gives you potential for any kind of unionization, if at all which wouldn't be possible if you're within the framework of the policy network. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, coming to the question of caste, yes, uh, it's a very interesting take, but let me tell you, we haven't really touched caste because, uh, you know, because of the intricacies. And, uh, and in fact, this whole study uh, 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 sort of is trying to capture uh, this uh, 
treating them as a sort of a homogeneous group in, in the sense highly marginalized informal workers and capturing their narratives as far as urban transformation goes. Uh, but uh, where, during our interviews, we could hear, uh, we heard quite a lot of stories about caste, but we, we have just uh, collected that, but we haven't uh, really used that. And uh, uh, coming to the spatial segregation and solidarity, strange it may seem, but let me tell you, actually, this is the spatial segregation actually uh, helped their solidarity among sex workers. Okay, I'll explain how. Uh, so just like any other informal uh, setup, uh, Within that informal setup, we can see very uh, kind of organized form of how to work, which are our areas. And as long as they don't cross their paths each other, it, there is a very uh, strong uh, you know, sense of solidarity. But that's, that's also nowadays threatened, thanks to this urban uh, transformation or the changes. Uh, so as you've rightly mentioned, uh, if you go to Hebbal areas, mainly transgender sex workers are uh, performing, providing service there and uh, uh, in KR market. So, let me also in tell you another thing. During our interview, something which we have heard, class, the whole idea of class works quite strong within this category of informal workers. So when we talk to the sex workers in KR market, they, they, they are probably serving to the, the migrant workforce which are coming there. And basically, why they're doing the sex work is mainly to meet their everyday requirements. But on the other side, when we talk to the transgender sex workers, they were quite... Uh, uh, vocal about uh, okay we are the poor lot but you should go to gay clubs and uh, online the other uh, you know forms of transgender sex workers they are not really affected by this revenge policies and so on so class really works uh, but it's mainly when the city expands and when the form of uh, uh, this re revengeism comes in different forms they are compelled to cross their uh, uh, areas. That's where mainly this happened. But at the same time, after Calcutta, uh, Bangalore, has, Karnataka has a very strong, we all know that Karnataka Sex Workers Union, that is very strong and that's actually very quite successful uh, for maintaining the solidarity. Another one is for transgender workers, they have their own uh, collective and there are uh, national level and local level various uh, collectives are there. And of course, a very strong set of non-governmental organization, individuals and so on, that's actually helping them too form the sort of a solidarity. Thank you. Yeah, sure, please. Um, yeah, so Kaya, I think you probably know, she's my PhD student. So obviously she has a very different, um, she did long-term um, in-depth ethnographic field work in malls in Delhi. And so she has a much richer understanding of, you know, um, some of these questions about retail workers um, that we could produce in our kind of short-term and more superficial study. Um, but it is true that I think if we kind of, uh, she also worked in higher end stores where there is a preference particularly for employees from the Northeast because they have a certain kind of look, they have a certain kind of facility with language and so on. Um, and so it's interesting to look at the gradations within retail work and we have quite a, a spread within ours where, <coughs> you know, th there is a kind of demand for certain kind of um, not very skilled um, a uh, young person from rural areas who doesn't have very good English, who, but who can slot into a certain segment of that late labor market. And then going up to the very high end, you know, like branded stores, where you have a very different social profile. So obviously, if you really wanted to map socially what, what this labor force looks like, you would have to make this kind of segmentation through much more you know, extended field work than we have been able to do. Thanks. Yeah. OK. Maybe last <laughs> question, because we are already, yeah. Uh, thank you for all your presentations. Uh, uh, I'll just make it short. Uh, my question is to you, Neeti. Um, and I was wondering if you could just tell us a little more about how the idea of the street sex worker uh, makes it uh, a very powerful uh, tool also somewhere and I'm coming at it from the vantage of the sex worker because like you said this is a very different space of transaction than a brothel for example and while I understand and I totally appreciate your idea of the urban vengeance and how they are routinely subjected to different forms of repression by authorities and uh, you know middle class uh, uh, prude people and all of that I would also want you to probably reflect a little bit more on the fluidity of the street 
and the kind of ephemerality and anonymity that the street brings. And is there any kind of strategy that is then employed by these street sex workers? I understand that they're cordoned off into different areas, etc. But is there something? Can we foreground the street and see if that helps them deploy certain kinds of strategies that working out of a brothel or some kind of a permanent structure won't be able to offer them? Give it quick answer uh, and after that we, let's maybe we can have a longer discussion in fact the second part of the book is exactly on this that is when these workers are uh, sort of uh, thrown out of street how do they survive we are basically looking at the it enabled services so technology and technology enabled services because nowadays uh, since uh, almost wherever you look at it there will be closer to your camera focusing you and the police and uh, you know all this so uh, our uh, workers they was telling us that now it's all over phone so i don't have to go to uh, i won't stand in a particular place and it's all over so that's the thing and that has its own challenges of course but i think we will discuss it more <laughs> later So I guess this panel finally, you know, provoke all of us by pushing us from equal cities to <laughs> more of inequal cities, right? So with this, uh, these conversations, I'm sure we can still continue and it will never stop in that way. But thanks, you know, thanks to the limited time, I guess we have to stop this here. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>